everybody. Sorry. I didn't make anyone deaf then. Sorry. Better? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, so, I'm Nicole, and this is how to get 100 content ideas in one hour. If you want to follow along with my talk, I uploaded the slides about 30 minutes ago. You can go to the address on the screen here and download them and follow along, or you can grab them. I'll have the URL again when I'm done with my talk, and you can grab the slides for yourself later. Um, bit.ly slash WCBOS dash Nicole. All right, just a quick introduction. My name is Nicole Poehler. I'm the content manager for WooCommerce at Automatic. Um, formerly, I worked as an e-commerce manager for four and a half years in the wallet decor industry, and I also worked as a content strategist at an agency outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I like sushi, Pokemon, I am playing Pokemon Go. Um, I love traveling and Oxford commas. I don't like cows, and I really don't like putting IKEA furniture together. Um, it's a long time. Okay, so today I'm going to show you how to come up with 100 content ideas in one hour. It's a lot of ideas in a little amount of time. And you might be asking why. So the reason I'm doing this talk is one of the biggest hurdles for people who are producing content, either for the first time or maybe people who've been blogging for a long time, um, they need to overcome that hurdle of constant generation of quality topics. If you don't know how to come up with these topics or where to find topics, you may feel like you have to give up, or you're stuck in a rut, or you don't know how to keep going with blogging or writing for your business. So creating and maintaining a backlog of quality content ideas can help you stay productive and keep you from abandoning your blog or giving up on writing for your business or getting into content marketing, whatever it is that you're doing. So my goal today is to show you tools, six tools, that will give you lots of ideas in a short amount of time. Here are the tools. I'm going to go through them step by step. They are Google, just play on Google. Uber Suggest, Hortense Content Idea Generator, your competitors, comments or questions, and the content that you've already created. So again, these six tools will help you get a bunch of ideas in a short amount of time and keep your blog or your content for your business thriving. So we'll start with Google. And the idea here is to use Google for topic research. Um, there are a lot of guides out there using Google for this, but the idea here is to use Google effectively, and by effectively I mean quickly, and not waste a lot of time. So what you want to do is look for existing content in your niche. So if you're writing about travel, look for existing content in other travel blogs. Or if your business sells ice melt, look for content about ice melt. If there's already content out there, take a look at it. Can you do it better? Um, is their content really short? Is it really weak? Is it not helping convert customers? Is it just flat? Excuse me, bad. Can you do it better? If no content exists, that's a great opportunity for you. You can do it really well. There's a gap for you. The search terms that you can use here, use the keywords or phrases that you already know that are identified with your business or your blog or your niche. Um, look for common questions that you've been asked before, or how to do X, how to accomplish Y. Those are the keywords that you can use, type into Google, and get a lot of results. Or if you don't get results, that can help you get a lot of ideas in a short amount of time. So basically, look at what's out there. If there's nothing out there, you have an opportunity. If there's something out there and it's not very good, that's also an opportunity. Tool number two is a tool called Uber Suggest. Um, in previous talks, I recommended a tool called KeywordTool.io. Um, KeywordTool.io is still pretty good for this, but it's kind of gotten dominated by ads recently, and they want you to sign up for a paid uh, plan. So Uber Suggest is what I'm recommending moving forward. It basically does the same thing. So Uber Suggest is a tool that lets you type in a keyword, and it gives you a bunch of keyword suggestions that are um, effectively long tail keyword suggestions. So if you put in the keyword how to sell online, it will give you suggestions like how to sell online quickly, how to sell online with WooCommerce, how to sell online um, to people that live in Pennsylvania or something like that. And it gives you hundreds of those. So um, 
The key here is to use it without wasting hours of your life, which I have done before. Hmm. So ideally, what the paper suggests, you want to start with the keywords that you've already identified as high drivers of traffic or revenue. And if you don't know what keywords are driving a lot of traffic or revenue, um, Google Analytics can help with that, and Jetpack Site Stats can help with that. So if you have Jetpack installed, you can take a look at um, what pages are getting a lot of traffic, and maybe where people came from, or if you have Google Analytics hooked up to your site or your blog, you can take a look at what keywords are coming through there. When you get a suggestion from Uber Suggest that you like, that you think looks really um, great, has a lot of potential, or you've never thought of it, um, check for existing content, just like you may have with Google. Um, is it something that you can one-up, or are there any gaps? If you see a lot of keywords with a lot of potential, don't fall into a pit, don't waste a lot of time, don't spend hours, as I have done before, on the Uber Suggest. Try to stick to one topic at a time, so maybe spend 15 minutes looking for keywords related to how to sell online. Or if you're in, again, a certain blogging niche, if you're blogging about food and you're looking around um, for a specific recipe, don't go and look at other food recipes. Try to stick to one topic at a time. And that will allow you to generate a lot of ideas for that one topic in a short amount of time. So here's a quick preview of what Uber Suggest looks like. I searched for sell online. Um, there's a small drop-down arrow that shows up beside each keyword, and it lets you search Google from there, look at Google Trends, and expand this keyword, which gives you slightly more information. The Google Trends option from Uber Suggest is really helpful because it shows you how popular that keyword is over time. And you can see for sell online, it's gone up and down, and up and down, and up and down. If you see a keyword that sounds interesting to you, and you look at the Google Trends data, and it's flatlined, that may not be a great idea for you to explore. But if you see something that's the exact opposite, take advantage of that. If there's no content out there, but the idea is really popular, and people are searching for that keyword a lot, and Google Trends shows that, jump on that. That's a great idea. Okay, tool number three. This is Portance Content, content Topic and Title Generator. This is a tool that I like to use um, maybe about five minutes a month. It doesn't take a lot of time, but it has a very, very high output potential. And this was developed by a marketing agency called Portent, as you may have guessed. So with this idea generator, you plug in a word, and it actually gives you topics for blog posts. Um, so all you do is plug in your topic or a popular subject, a word from your niche, or something you want to write broadly about. You can save the titles that sound like they have potential, even if they're not perfect. And I'll show you what I mean by not perfect in a second. And you can iterate on them later. So put them in a spreadsheet, put them in Evernote, put them in SimpleNote, save them for later. And you can tweak them later, you can use them later. Um, don't waste the time on that now. Just save anything that sounds like it has potential. And again, you can put it in a Google search, you can look at trends, you can you know, do whatever you want to evaluate that later, but save those ideas now. If you want a challenge, use an idea as is. So, I put WooCommerce in the title generator. This is what it looks like. The first suggestion I got was unbelievable WooCommerce success stories. This is actually a really good blog post title. Like, this is something I would probably write for our blog. <laughs> so, I was, I was really happy with this. Um, if you've got something like this, again, even if it's not perfect, like this might be slightly too broad, this might be something that people are like, oh gosh, I've heard this before. Save it, you can iterate on it. Maybe we want to write about, write about four unbelievable WooCommerce success stories for people selling coffee online, okay? Again, this is just the start of your idea, save it. Um, the thing with the content idea generator is it is not always perfect. You have to hit that little refresh button of, on the right a few times sometimes before you get a winner. Um, why you shouldn't eat WooCommerce in bed is not a great idea. Um, but, you know, it's a start. Maybe we should write an article about why you shouldn't sell online from bed. I don't know. Okay, moving on. Two more, bleh, tool number four is your competition. Um, you want to get inspired by the content of your competition. You don't want to look at them and be like, oh, they're doing so 
such a good job. I hate them. How are they doing all this? Oh, why are they doing so good? Don't look at it that way. Don't be negative about it. Try to get inspired. So what are they doing really, really well that you can look at and say, you know what, that's a great idea. Don't do the same thing. Don't copy them, obviously. But, you know, maybe look at it and say, I, you know, I never thought of this. I never thought about doing customer stories. I never thought about doing pay studies. I never thought about writing about my own experience with this thing in my niche. Look at what they're doing and see what can inspire you. On the other hand, I've mentioned this two or three times now, where are they lacking? Can you identify any opportunities to succeed? So if you have a competitor, um, say you blog about food and your competitor isn't writing about their own experience making a recipe for the first time, and you think that's a really good opportunity, do it, jump on it. Look at their comments and their feedback. If you know what's resonating with their readers, it might resonate with your readers as well. So their comments and their feedback can be a really great source of inspiration for you too. Um, and one final note, everyone has competition. Even if you don't think that's true, even if you think, I'm just a blogger, like no one's competing with me. Everyone has a competitor. It doesn't matter if it's another blogger, it doesn't matter if it's another company. You just have to look and look out at what's out there and think, these people are vying for the same readers and the same attention that I am. So technically they are competitors. So number five, we're getting close to the end here of the list, blog comments and email questions. So answering these comments and questions gives you instant content. If you get a question about a piece of content you've already published, whether that's a blog post or a long form piece of content or even a page on your website, you can answer that in a separate piece. So if someone emails you and is like, hey, um, how much does it cost to ship this thing? You actually could answer that in a piece of content. Or if someone asks, hey, um, how much salt should I put in this disc? Or dish, wow. <laughs> Don't put salt in floppy disks, that's probably a bad idea. Um, that's a separate piece of content. Again, think of questions as opportunities to write separate pieces of content. Because you already know that there's a need to answer those questions. If there's a lot of comments with praise on something that you've already published, it shows that the topic that you've chosen has really resonated with the people who are reading that piece. So maybe you should expand upon that. Maybe you should write a follow-up piece, or maybe you should transform that piece into a similar medium. I'm gonna talk about that next. Um, and you can research or brainstorm similar posts that link to that first piece of content. So if you iterate on a highly discussed piece of content, make sure you link them all together, um, whether that's with a related post plugin or by manually linking the two together or both, I would say do both. And that helps you capitalize on your success, especially for future readers. If someone comes to your site six months from now and reads the first piece and then sees that you have a follow-up, they'll read the follow-up and then read the follow-up to that and follow-up to that and they'll stay on your site for longer and longer and longer and become more and more engaged with you. So think of this as planning for the future. This is an example we actually got on the WooCommerce blog. Um, the commenter here, Olivia Bello, this is a guy that runs a cycling wear shop. He's really, really smart. He knows what he's doing. Um, he commented on a post about the must-have qualities for product pages. And one of the things that I recommended was having detailed copy for your products. So explain in depth why someone wants a, you know, a particular product, blah, blah, blah. And his comment was, I don't agree with the copy bit. We did that, had great copy, but our site audit this year decided on a less is more principle. This approach is a battle for SEO, but in our case, our market is educated, so giving them a sharp, to the point sentence or two, and then the product features in a clear and simple manner has turned out to be the best approach. And this got us thinking on our content team, like, you know, is having a really in-depth product description always the way to go? And we chatted with this guy back and forth in emails a little bit. We ended up doing a case study with him, which is a really, really good read because, again, he's really sharp. And we wrote a follow-up post on how to find the ideal length of your product copy. This is one of the most successful posts in our blog, not just because someone asked for it, but because it made other people think in the same way that this customer was thinking. Is long copy always a good fit for our site? Not just because of SEO, but because Maybe your target market already knows everything about your product. They don't need to read a huge, you know, three paragraph thing. Maybe your target market isn't educated, and then they do need to read a lot before purchasing. 
So again, this is a really successful post, and it all came from a comment that someone thought to leave for us. So if you're getting comments like that, think about them. Think about what you could do to iterate on them and make some really cool content. So the final tool is existing content. And by this I mean blog posts you've already published, if you make videos, if you make pages on your site, transform that content, repurpose it, and remix it into new pieces of content. So for example, if you have a blog post, you could make that into a video, you could make it into an infographic, or you could add it into a long-form piece of content like a guide. If a piece of content is particularly successful as it is, it's ripe for the picking to transform. And the reason for this is because not everyone learns in the same way. There are some people that don't want to sit down and read a long guide to something. They want to watch videos. We found this ourselves. We have a lot of docs, but some people learn best from videos, so we have a WooCommerce 101 video series. Then there are some people that don't want to watch videos. I actually am one of them. I prefer to read and then try it myself. So maybe you have a doc that comes from a video, and then the people can go try it themselves from the, the details they read in the doc. So again, try transforming successful content into different formats to cater to the people that learn differently. If you don't know what your current successful pieces are, again, Jetpack site stats or Google Analytics can tell you. They can tell you what the most traffic pieces are by month, by year, of all time. Um, they can also tell you what has a spike in popularity. You can look at the number of comments on a piece too, et cetera, et cetera. So, I'm going to give you all a moment to digest that, because I need some water. Right now, you might be thinking, I'm supposed to do all this in an hour? That's a lot. A lot of stuff, Nicole, what are you doing? And it is possible to do all this in an hour, to use these six tools and come up with a lot of ideas in an hour. But the key to accomplishing this, to getting these 100 ideas in an hour, is to spend only a few minutes with each tool because they're only going to yield so many ideas at once. Ideally, an hour spent using these tools should be part of a repeatable process that you perform on a regular basis. This shouldn't be a one and done type thing. It should be something that you do repeatedly for your blog, for your website, for anywhere else that you're producing content. So here's a sample breakdown if you're doing this repeatedly. For one month, you might use a Google search to come up with 15 ideas. You might spend a couple of minutes looking at your competitors and come up with 15 ideas from them. You might get 10 from Uber Suggest, five from blog comments, five from reversing your contents, or your current content, excuse me. And the next month, these values might flip around. So you might get 20 ideas from repurposing your content. You might only get five ideas from Google. So again, each month, use the process, use the tools. But that's not 100 ideas at all. <laughs> well, it doesn't need to be if you're doing it every month. My recommendation is when you start doing this process, have a 100 idea sprint session. Spend an hour. Bury yourself in these tools, you lock yourself in a quiet room that helps, and get as many ideas down with these tools as you can. Then start the process, evaluate the ideas, choose the ones you want to develop, and each month do the process again. You don't need to have 100 ideas each month, but get yourself in the habit of using these tools, evaluating your competitors, going on Google, seeing what's new, and add every idea that you come up with to a stockpile. Choose the ideas you want to develop in content and continue adding to the stockpile each month, even if you don't have 100 ideas. Let's face it, you don't need 100 new ideas each month, but to start with, if you're feeling like you're running out of ideas, if you're running out of inspiration, having a stockpile of 100 ideas from all these tools and all these various sources can be absolutely amazing. It can get you regenerated. It can get you feeling like you're right at the top of the world, like you have a ton of things to write about. Um, it may even make you feel, feel really silly about the idea of giving up on your blog. Um, I've been there, and I've done an idea spurt like this, and then I looked at myself and was like, why did I even think that I should stop writing? If you keep doing these sprints, 
you may never run out of things to write about. And if you're in a niche that's really narrow, you may be like, that, no, that's impossible. Like, someday I'm gonna hit a brick wall. And I felt like that with WooCommerce every now and then. I'm like, no, we're, we're gonna run out at some point. We're not gonna run out. We have like 300 ideas to have work right now. <laughs> we have a lot of ideas. So here's a real life scenario. I'm just gonna share a little bit about how the WooCommerce content team operates. When we first formed last April, we dumped every single idea we had in the spreadsheet, whether it came from our own heads, from the existing content on the blog, from Google search, from tools like Uber Suggest, and it was over 100 ideas in a short amount of time. We actually did this exercise. So that all went in a Google Sheet. And every month, we started to add between 10 and 50 new ideas from the sources I named. Um, we look at our competitors a lot, we look at Google, we look at our comments a lot. Our comments after about a year and a half have started to become one of the best sources for ideas for us. And now we meet monthly to evaluate these ideas and choose the ones to act on. Um, we also have a scoring system for our ideas, and I will say since we've established that, we only choose about 11 or 12 ideas to write each month. Our stockpile is enormous. So again, we're, we're not going to run out of ideas, and if you do the same process, you won't either. You might sometimes feel like you have too many ideas, which is another problem. <laughs> so here's a quick glimpse at what our planning spreadsheet looks like. The whole thing won't fit on the screen. But we basically have, what's your idea? How did you get the idea? Um, is it time sensitive? Then we have this scoring thing on the right side. So you can see just a few of the ideas, like blogging for e-commerce, some WooCommerce stores, um, tips for improving the shipping email. For me, that was when I suggested the Fitbit has a really good shipping email. I love them so much. And then we use a tool called CoSchedule. When we actually pick the ideas that we want to use, we put them on a calendar, and this helps us visualize what's publishing when. We used to use Trello. If you don't have a big team, or you're publishing yourself, I recommend Trello to start with, because you can also enable calendar mode in Trello. CoSchedule's great for big teams, but um, Trello will help you get things on a calendar quickly for one person. But again, this helps us visualize what's publishing when and which ideas are coming to life, and also who's responsible. So summing all of this up, you can use free tools and resources you probably already have, like your blog comments, like your questions, like your current content, to generate lots of ideas quickly, at first 100 in an hour, and when you start this process, a content sprint will help you build up this idea stockpile. And if you keep maintaining this idea stockpile by adding ideas quickly and evaluating them each month, you're going to have a lot of content that you can create moving forward. You're not going to run out of ideas, you're not going to feel like you have to give up, and you're going to have a lot of tools that you can use whether it's in a process or just on demand, if you feel like, oh, I need a content idea really fast. You're, you have six tools that you can pick from. Just go use pick. So, final tips. Just um, some advice from my experience at Woo. There are no bad ideas. Um, why not to eat WooCommerce in bed was kind of bordering on a bad idea. <laughs> but we often say no but to the ideas that are offered to us. Like maybe it's something we've already written about, maybe it's not interesting to our customers, but the ideas may not be 100% a good fit, but parts of them are centered around a customer need. So if someone says like, hey, let's do 10 WooCommerce success stories. Okay, well everyone has seen, like in our industry, for our customers, 10 WooCommerce success stories. What can we do differently with those? Maybe it's a particular niche, so like I said, WooCommerce success stories for people who are running a coffee shop. Maybe they need to be inspired. Maybe we've identified those customers as needing inspiration, as needing help. So again, we're saying no, but, and we're, we're improving upon that. Brainstorming without a tool, just using your own inspiration, using your head to come up with ideas, can be really productive, um, to a point. The reason I recommend using tools and using resources you already have, like rooted in your blog, rooted in your existing content, is because the most successful content is anchored in real, expressed needs. 
Um, and by this I mean if someone is searching for something on Google, if there's a Google trend, that's a real expressed need. People are showing they need that information. If someone asks for something in a comment, they are asking for that information. Versus brainstorming, you don't really have a good way to measure if someone needs that or wants that. You're just kind of coming up with that in your own head. And again, create a routine and make a priority in your own life to go through with this process. Brainstorm these ideas. Put it on your calendar if you have to. It doesn't have to be something that you personally stick to, like, oh, I have to do it this hour, this day, every single month. But if you don't make it a priority and it starts to slip, you may get in that, that um, you know, you may start running with ideas. And you may get back into that mindset of, I have no choice but to give up. I don't know what to write about. Making it a priority makes sure that you never run out of things to write about. Okay. Semester resources. Um, Basecamp is something that I recommend for a large content team who's collaborating on pieces. Or if you're an individual, it also works for keeping track of individual projects that are larger. So if you're working on a content like a long form guide or a video series, it helps you as a person keep track of all the moving parts. Um, I used that previously at a content agency and that was really, really, really helpful. Simple note or Evernote. This helps you stash ideas away for later. If you get an idea randomly or if you see something really, really good on Google, just jot it down in there, save it for later. Um, you can also do that in Google Sheets as we do at, at Woo. I tend to use Simple Note for the ideas I haven't completely formed yet. And then when I feel good about making them public facing, I'll put them in our Google Sheet. And then I have two links at the bottom for you. If you have the slides, you can just click these links. Um, copyblogger.com slash getideas. This is a short article about some more tools that you can use to get content ideas that are rooted in express needs. And blog.kissmetrics.com. This is a list of 101 ways to get content ideas. I only went into six. Um, there are at least 90 some more. <laughs> and this is a really, it's a really quick list. I mean, it's just like a, like a two cents description of each. But this goes into like using your competitor's infographics, um, using Google Trends as a standalone tool. It can be a really helpful resource. If for some reason these tools aren't cutting it for you, I definitely recommend checking out the Kissmetrics article. It has a lot of really, really good suggestions. Okay, as I mentioned, the slides are available right now. Um, they're on bit.ly slash WCBOS dash Nicole, or you can go to my site, littleyellowpenguin.com, and they are on the front page or my Twitter, at Nicole C. Kohler. I tweeted them out about 35 minutes, well, longer than that now. Tweeted them out about an hour ago. Um, if you have any questions later, feel free to tweet me. But as for now, this is the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate your time. And I will open it up for questions. In the back. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, coming from the uh, design developer side, this may be a question that I'm going to ask. <clears throat> what percentage, or phrases, <clears throat> how, how do you determine your content? Is your content mostly determined by your client's needs, or is it also determined by the analytics that you flow in? in, in that makes sense? It does make sense. So, like, um, should you be producing content based more on what they say they need or what their customers are saying they need through, like, analytics? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, or what you as a provider think they need. Got it, got it. It can be a mix, really, of all of those things. Um, sometimes when you start with a client, like in my, my agency experience, you would look at their same site and say, you know, you guys are missing some basic things. You're missing an FAQ page. You're missing, you're not answering shipping questions. There are times that I look at pages in the WooCommerce showcase and they're not answering very, very basic questions. So maybe tackle those first. If you see something that you realize is an immediate need, um, just from common sense, feel free to tackle that first. You don't have to do research for that. Um, so use your gut there, that's totally fine. Again, if they feel like something is missing, um, you can use your gut on that, but maybe do a double check. Use site stats, use Google Analytics, use other data sources, Kissmetrics is another really good one. And look at 
what customers are actually asking for or what they're actually searching for in relation to that niche or that topic or those products before producing content. And you may have to go back to the client and say, I know this sounds like a great idea, but we've done some research and we're finding that people aren't searching for this as much as they used to. Here's an idea that's similar to this, but I think will give you better returns. And if you approach it in that way, they're more likely to agree. Good? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Uh, I saw two. You can go first. Uh, how much time do you spend writing a blog post? Okay, so the question was, how much time do I spend writing a blog post? Um, my average for each post is about eight hours. And this is from start to finish. This is coming up with the idea, um, improving the idea, doing an outline, because we outline our, all of our items first before we do a draft, doing the first draft, editing, get a second set of eyes, and preparing the social publishing, preparing the graphics, preparing any special graphics, preparing product tie-ins, doing links. Um, this is probably not the norm for most blogs, since this is a um, company blog and a very large company blog, and we have a very, 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 very big backlog of content, like not just blog posts, but product pages and docs, the linking aspect is pretty big. I have to link out to probably 10 other assets in each post. So that takes me an hour and a half on its own sometimes. Um, in the past, when I was working at an agency, my average production time for a blog post was three to four hours max. So I would say, um, depending on your subject matter, that can alter the amount of time that you spend on, on, on publishing a lot. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Over here. I'm kind of going with that, and I'm new to a lot of this, and I was hearing somebody saying some blogs are getting longer. What would, and you're mentioning like the time, what's your typical length of these, you know, how many words or that type of thing? Okay, I love this question so much. <laughs> um, the question was, what's the typical length of a blog post? Right. Basically? And, and it may be how many pictures or graphs or is there a limit to that thing? Okay. And maybe how many, how many images, graphs, is there a limit? There is no one answer to this. It actually depends more on what your audience needs than what you think is right. And the way you find this is honestly just trial and error. What we found at Woo over the course of a year and a half of testing was that 1,500 words is the sweet spot. We have images roughly in every section. Um, illustrations don't really do it for us. We tend to do screenshots of products, um, stock photos, as long as they don't look cheap. I hate cheap stock photos. Um, and images that complement our subject matter in the header and as a featured image on social. Um, if you are in a niche where your customers don't have a large attention span, like if they're coming to your site, say for a recipe, and they want to get the recipe and leave, and your content goes on and on and on and on and on, you probably aren't going to have a lot of readers, unless you have really great photos. I'm, I'm going to like add an exception there because if I go to a site for a recipe and they have awesome photos, my reaction is, oh, I want to do that. <laughs> I, I don't always do that very well. I'm not a good cook. But if you're in a niche where people need a ton of information and they come to your site and they don't get what they need and they get like a 200 word article, they're going to be mad. They're going to go in the other direction. They're going to go to your competitors. So it's kind of like a feeling out thing, right? There is no one answer. You have to sort of guess based on what your customers want. Um, one of my favorite things to say with regards to this question is do not be afraid to talk to your customers. They are there for a reason. Um, ask your readers, am I giving you enough? Is this long enough for you? Is this too long for you? Put a poll on your site. Email them. Reach out to them. Put something on Facebook. Don't, don't be afraid to ask them, like, is this too much for you? Am I not giving you enough? Um, some of them will answer, I promise. They, they aren't afraid of you and you shouldn't be afraid of them. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. Right here. Have you found that using the inverted pyramid style of journalist reviews would eliminate some of this problem? So if they get the most of what they want in the beginning, and the details are the bottom? Yeah, it's sort of like a sales funnel. So the question was, um, using the inverted pyramid style of journalism, I'm not personally familiar with that. Um, do you mind? Do you mind going to the mic and explaining it a bit? Thank you so much. Uh, the inverted pyramid was created because um, because.
because of the layout, um, the writers wouldn't know what the editors would do, so they could cut safely from the bottom. Speak in the mic. Um, the least important things were at the bottom, and the main stuff is at the top. So you'd have a big headline that encompassed the whole big idea, and then and then come down to less and less important things for those who want the little itty bitty details. Then when an editor had to cut to fit it into the page editor had to cut to fit it into uh, the layout, you weren't losing the most important stuff. You cut from the bottom. All right. And so I'm thinking that the, the person can stop reading at any point, and um, you will have gotten the most of, of the important ideas. Got it. I have honestly not thought of that. Um, that's a really good suggestion. So if you're creating content for an audience for the first time, or if you're relatively new to this, that is something that you could try. That's a really good suggestion. Um, the way we write for Woo is, is not like that at all. I might actually give that a try. And I would just suggest Googling inverted pyramid style to, to get more information. Okay, so Google inverted pyramid style. If you're curious about that, you can find some more info. Um, we tend to add the facts that are necessary all throughout the post and put them in bold, which is something else you can try to catch people's, um, catch people's eyes, make sure that you're reading. And we put a summary at the end of the post where there's a lot of information. So that way they're not um, losing something that they really need to see. It's in bold so it will catch their attention. And it's at the end, so if they miss something or if they forgot something, they can get it again. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Can you show it again? Oh, can I show it again? Yes. Right there. Thank you. No problem. Okay, one more, one more. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could just give a very basic example of what you call a tie-in. What do you mean by a tie? Do you want to elaborate? A tie-in. Like to? Like what you said earlier. Because that kind of came late, so. When did I say that? I'm sorry. Like, like a tie-in to another piece of content? Right. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay, I was like, when did I say that? What did I do? No, no. Um, so what I mean by a tie-in is basically a link to a related piece of content, or if you sell products on your site, a link to a relevant product. It might be a call to action, or it might be a way to keep a potential customer, or a reader, or um, just another visitor active on your site and reading relevant information to keep them around longer. So it's usually a link. Sometimes it's a call to action. It's the final call to action on your post or on your piece of content. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I was just wondering if you could give like a, an example you know, sure. that you've done yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we wrote a post um, not that long ago about how to run a WooCommerce subscription site, site better um, with some examples from real stores. So the tie-ins we had in there were the links to the stores, so you could actually look at the stores. But then we also had links to other posts we've written on how to set up a subscription site, how to get started with WooCommerce subscriptions, and the call to action at the end was get started with WooCommerce subscriptions, purchase the extension. Okay? If you have any more questions about that, just feel free to stop me later. I, I don't know if I answered your question very well. Okay, um, I think we're out of time. Yeah, so uh, if you have any other questions, please come to Commerce Booth or tweet me afterward. I'll be happy to help you. Thank you again for listening, and good luck with your content.